good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nicole Parsons, and I'm going to be talking to you today about opaque building enclosures and um, some considerations around the St. Lawrence Center for the Arts, as well as some uh, general information about things to keep in mind and consider uh, for high performance building enclosures, specifically the opaque portion. So our um, presentation and our, the process that we're using here is loosely based around the Savings by Design program. So that's uh, why you'll see that throughout the presentation. Why can't I advance my slides? There we go. Uh, so St. Leonard, St. Lawrence Center for the Arts and the re uh, the redevelopment of that facility is has inspired some of the specific topics that we're going to be uh, looking at today. Of course, we're still very early in the process, so these are um, general considerations for uh, high performance enclosures, cultural centers, um, that that sort of realm of buildings. So, of course, we want a durable building enclosure. We want a building enclosure that's going to last a long time, that's going to do what it is meant to do. Uh, so some of those aspects that feed into that durability that we're going to look at are uh, moisture safety in terms of both water leakage, but also um, condensation considerations. We're going to talk about uh, air leakage considerations and, of course, the big one, uh, thermal performance and how that relates back to the building energy use. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about some uh, safety considerations that come around um, when you're using unique or new um, building shapes, building forms, building materials on the outside of a building. So really, Everything we're going to talk about kind of comes down to this. We have this, um, you know, this target. We found this picture of this cupcake and we're going to make it. And we have a process that we have to follow from start to finish. And in our uh, construction world, we have the schematic design, detailed design, tender and procurement. And then we get to move into construction and finally the closeout and we reach the finish, and what we're trying to avoid is situation like this. So how, you know, how can we go through this construction process and design process and end up with a product that um, really is a lot closer to the original intent than, than what these pictures show? So, you know, we may as well start talking about the people on the team and um, the the experts that are recommended and required in order to um, meet these these demands. When you have uh, enclosure consulting, a, uh, a an expert who works with the designer, which was the designer is usually the architect, and um, provides expert advice on all of these enclosure related items, which we're going to get into. And then you have the enclosure commissioner uh, who is really involved to identify potential problems, uh, but not necessarily provide solutions to those problems. Um, they're, they're there to raise red flags for the design team, uh, help them identify areas where they may need to pay more attention. And, and then at the end of the project, they, the commissioner is also involved in any uh, testing and verification of the performance of the enclosure systems to make sure that they've met those project requirements. Uh, now there's a note here that says the enclosure consultant is often not involved until later in the project, which is very true, um, which, but also problematic. Because when we look at um, the impact that any project team member can have on a construction project, it's a diminishing returns situation. 
and an increasing cost situation. So the farther we are into the project, um, the less a new team member is able to influence the, the outcome of the project and the more it's going to cost to execute any changes on the project. So we're really wanting to have um, those experts involved very early in the project so that we can avoid these kinds of costly changes later in the project. And so that's why we're going to talk about things that we would talk to a client about, um, questions we would ask very early in the process to help uh, steer things in the right direction and, and really help the client realize the maximum benefit um, from having the enclosure consultant involved. So the first thing is energy targets. You know, what, what are their energy targets? Um, what is driving those energy targets? What are they really, what to, you know, what is really important to them? And you know, we're trying, is we, we want to try to build something that kind of hits that target. We don't want to have all these misses involved. Um, and you know, you might be saying, well, why does the energy target really, why does it really matter when we're talking about the enclosure? Um, we, we're not talking about the mechanical systems or you know, you're not the energy modeler, but the enclosure can have a fairly significant impact on the energy use of a building. So when we're looking at architectural features of a building, uh, just architectural features, not, not the mechanical or electrical, uh, the envelope has a very significant impact on the, uh, the heating and cooling loads of the building. So on the, the two circles on the left show you, uh, the top left is the impact on the heating loads. You can see that it, it's you know, over half of the impact of the architectural features. And then on the cooling loads, it's uh, a significant, more, it's you know, five, five, six approximately. And then we've broken those out. So on heating loads, uh, a good chunk of that impact is from the opaque wall thermal performance, which is a really the kind of bulk of what we're gonna talk about today. And then you also have the window influence, the window thermal performance, the window to wall ratio, uh, and you'll have a, a separate performance or a separate presentation on windows that will look at those aspects. Uh, and then the cooling loads in, in our heating based climate, um, the cooling loads are really wholly impacted by the windows from an envelope perspective. So uh, the window to wall ratio, you know, how many windows are there? <laughs> And then the window solar heat gain performance, how much heat is, are those windows letting in? Because obviously the more heat that comes in, the more cooling that's needed in the middle of the summer. Uh, so really we're talking about the opaque wall thermal performance and um, we'll keep in mind that that has an impact on helping reduce heating loads in the building. Uh, the other thing to, to keep in mind about the enclosure thermal performance um, and tied to the energy use because with the Toronto Green Standard you know we don't only we look at, at the energy use intensity um, we don't only look at the total energy use for the year so when we start looking at at those other targets um, it really starts being influenced even more by the enclosure and the, uh, the kind of outcome of that, the benefit of that, um, one of the reasons why that's important is because of resiliency. So when we look at the graph on the left, the one with the pink background, um, we're looking at a blackout situation that occurs in the summer. You can see that blackout line and uh, unfortunately these are in degrees Fahrenheit, but the, the baseline temperature in the building is that blue line at 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And that gray line represents uh, the fluctuating temperatures from day to night, it, typical summer temperatures, historical temperatures. Um, and then as we move across to the right of that graph, you can see that that solid blue line, um, although all blue lines are climbing, that solid blue line climbs slower and has less drastic peaks than the dotted blue lines. And the solid blue line represents the um, 
higher performance of enclosure performance. So these are these are based on different levels of the Toronto Green Standard. So that solid blue line is the highest level. Um, gives you keeps the space livable for the longest period of time in the case of losing power. Um, and then this, the graph on the right is the same kind of idea, but it's for uh, winter. So it looks at how fast the temperature drops versus how fast it rises. Uh, and the same situation is true. That solid blue line is the highest performance level. And then the dotted blue lines are as you, um, as you kind of step back the performance a bit. And the gray line is the outdoor temperatures. So you can see that um, the, the higher the performance of enclosure that you have, the longer um, a building is going to stay occupiable in the event of a power loss. So uh, we're looking, you know, a three-day power outage at, at the lower levels of uh, performance. So that this is from version three, but currently we're at TGS version four. So uh, version three tier two is now version four tier one. Uh, so after 72 hours of power outage, meeting that, that base Toronto Green Standard requirement now, you, your interior temperature be 14.6. After two weeks, uh, your interior temperature is 7.6, so definitely not livable. Whereas at uh, version four, tier three, uh, which is version three, tier four, you're at 19.7 after 72 hours and 18.3 after two weeks. So you're really looking at um, a, a space that is still occupiable. And you might be saying, but this is a performing arts center. Why do we need to occupy it in the event of a blackout in the middle of winter? Um, because we have all kinds of uh, housing stock in the city that was built well before these Toronto Green Standard requirements came in, right? We have single family homes and high rises and all kinds of residential uh, buildings that are going to be uninhabitable within a day of the power going out and being uh, you know, a public building, in the, or a community building, the public realm. Uh, maybe, maybe the city wants to use it as a, a shelter type facility for people to um, relocate from their homes in the event of, of mass power outage like we had during the ice storm a number of years ago uh, or in the summer, you know, even, even longer back, we're probably cl close to 20 years ago, we had the summer power outage. Um, maybe, maybe they wanna use this facility as a potential community space where people can come and stay and be comfortable when their homes are, uh, are not inhabitable due to the power being out. So something to, to think about and talk about with the client early on um, to see if, if that's something that they're considering. And then, especially with this kind of a cultural space, we want to talk about special interior conditions. Uh, this is a photo from the ROM. Obviously, they're not going to have dinosaur skeletons in the St. Lawrence Centre for the Arts, but uh, it's meant to represent, you know, will they have things inside these spaces that have very stringent and um, specific interior condition requirements to keep them in in their proper condition. It, musical instruments, for example, have uh, lots of them that are made of wood, have specific storage requirements. Will there be anything like that? Um, will there be specific requirements in the performance spaces for uh, temperature and relative humidity for comfort of the performers? Um, all of that stuff is, it, it's twofold because High humidity conditions um, necessitate higher performance enclosures, and we'll, we'll talk about how that ties in in a little bit. Um, but also, you need uh, an enclosure that is going to help keep the space at a consistent temperature. If you have um, a, a lower performing enclosure, the space 
naturally becomes more susceptible to influence from the outside temperature, uh, more pressure on your mechanical systems, can you, will the mechanical systems be able to keep up, all of that good stuff. Um, so it's always, it's always uh, good to know, and it's important to know if there's anything special to consider for the inside above and beyond the standard um, the standard requirements for comfort and and that sort of thing and so related to that um, we have the building enclosure performance so some of these photos show um, you know, like water issues the top uh, the two photos on the right, you have some wet interior insulation there. Um, that kind of situation where you have that interior insulation is uh, if you have a high humidity space, the risks of condensation in that kind of situation are very difficult to manage. So maybe you want to design a wall that uh, that is different, that doesn't have that interior insulation. Then you also have... Uh, you know, moisture on the windowsill in that top middle window, in that top middle photo, and whether that's from water leakage coming in through the window or whether that's from condensation, you know, this it's not clear in this photo. But uh, either way, it's obviously a problem. It can lead to um, mold and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but it can also just generally lead to water spots unsightly conditions if it's a public space you know you don't want people having to deal with that uh, it can damage interior finishes if there's some kind of uh, a display or something going on and they have items close to the windows or close to the exterior walls uh, you don't want that kind of uh, risk where you might damage some of these important artifact important items that they might have the other three photos the two on the left and the one on the bottom center uh, are showing situations of air leakage, uh, discontinuous membrane, and, and missing seals. The bottom left photo is a thermography scan where um, the yellow is is warm. The yellow and the yellow white are you know, 16 degrees Celsius. The purple is more around five zero to five degrees Celsius. Um, so we have this situation here where we have a very warm line in that canopy and that's either air leakage through the enclosure um, or it's a thermal bridge and if that uh, if that situation is not dealt with then you're going to end up with cold spots on the inside which again can lead to condensation it can lead to comfort issues uh, so still talking about durability, um, another thing that we should be, be asking and talking about early in the process is, it, are there plans for a unique facade material or geometry? Um, are there things we need to consider on that front? So this is a uh, rendering, mostly because I have no way to get anyone to take a photo from this vantage of this building. Uh, this is Studio Bell, home of the National Music Center in Calgary. Uh, it was designed by Allied Works. This is their rendering, and uh, it's a building that I personally was in. I personally was involved in, but the the reason that it's uh, relevant here is it's a cultural space. It's a it's a statement building. Um, it has a lot of those. It had a lot of those same kind of targets and uh, ideals as what is kind of being considered for the St. Lawrence Center for the Arts in this very early stage that we are. Uh, so this building is clad in terracotta. Um, they have terracotta tiles in front of the windows even. Uh, so the, the bridge area that spans the street, there's windows there, you can see the little renderings of the people inside, but there are spaced out terracotta tiles in front of those windows. Um, as well as the lighter vertical sections on the main two main parts of the building. Those are all spaced out tiles that allow you to see out through the window. So in this situation, in this case, this is something that hadn't been done in Canada before, um, hadn't been done in a climate like ours before. Um, so it, it leads to additional considerations when we're helping with the design of the enclosure. If this is 
if, if there's something unique the client's going after. Some of those, so for this, in this situation, for, for this building, for not, sorry, for National Music Center building, um, we, we had to do a snow and ice study. So we had to look at how is snow going to accumulate on these unique areas of spaced out tiles? Is this going to be a problem? You know, you saw you had that, that bridge over the, over the street. Um, are we going to have issues where we have snow and ice falling? Are we going, you know, what's what's going to happen this is uh, amazing enclosure an amazing facade but it's it's unique nobody no nobody can say um, how it's going to react until we do testing so in this case it's a, you know it's a great thing that we did testing uh, we have that bridge over the street and uh, during testing it was discovered that that snow and ice that built up on the tiles as, that we saw in the last slide uh, would slide off of the tiles. So of course you don't want that, you know, however have, have many hours after a snowstorm, you don't want that sliding off onto cars and people below. So the original architectural design, which is shown in the top left, uh, was modified and a heated gutter was added along the bottom of that bridge so that any uh, snow and ice that slid off those tiles, um, would be caught in that gutter, it would melt by the heating cables and be able to drain away. And doing this, you know, identifying this early in the process and being able to, to do the appropriate due diligence um, allowed this, to, this gutter, as well as some other features, uh, to be incorporated in the design early and therefore to uh, minimize the amount of extra cost to the client because we identified it early. Um, we were able to work with the team to make the design changes and minimize the cost, but also able to make the design changes in such a way that they had minimal impact on the final form of the building. You know, it was before construction, so it wasn't that changes were being made on site and, and sacrifices to the architectural form were having to be made. Um, and so, and, and this is just one example of, uh, of things to, that, that could come up depending on the material and the form that, that they're thinking. And this just shows some of the areas of concern. So the bottoms of all of those uh, light color vertical bands that I had identified where there were open tiles and as well as the bridge and then the uh, the potential of icing along the road and along underneath those vertical bands. And so special gutters were applied above the, the windows at grade, across the bottom of that bridge. Uh, this building has been completed now for, uh, I want to say, six years, I think. Um, and no, no issues. And I mean, I'm sure Calgary has had lots of crazy weather in that time because that's what happens in Calgary. Uh, so then, you know, we've talked about these unique things that are unique to uh, a cultural facility that has really ambitious targets and that is looking to be a, a hub of the community, but. Um, we still need to talk about the, the quote unquote basics. We, we need to talk about the thermal performance of the enclosure. Um, how are we going to help them meet their energy targets? How are we going to help meet uh, any resiliency targets they may have? How are we going to help contribute to um, maintaining and management of any special interior conditions they may have? How are we going to make the building perform from an energy perspective now is related to the thermal performance of the enclosure. Uh, so just a little visualization, right? We have the coat, we're nice and warm, um, but unfortunately we can't just wrap a building in insulation because what's going to hold it up? What's going to hold the cladding up? What's going to hold the building up? Um, there are going to be interruptions. So we we automatically 
without being able to do anything about it, we go from a coat to a vest. And the question is, how much of that insulation is go are we going to lose? How many interruptions are there going to be? Um, thermal bridges is what we call them. How, how frequent are they going to be? How drastic are they going to be? How can we minimize them? But also, how can we properly understand their impact so that uh, it's properly reflected in any energy modeling uh, that is done? Any it can be proper. It can be used to help properly size mechanical equipment. All of that kind of uh, good stuff. So we're going to get into thermal performance. We're going to have to talk about uh, the different insulation values that. Uh, that exist. So first we have our insulating materials and that the values of those which are the material properties which are tested and reported by the manufacturers would be the nominal R values or nominal thermal resistance of the enclosure. Uh, we then get to a situation where we have the things like uh, studs which if you have insulation on the inside portion of the wall, there's going to be studs within that insulation. And then you have the cladding support system on the outside portion of the wall that's going to be um, penetrating through that insulation. So once we take into account the losses related to those kinds of features, those regular repeated features within the wall, um, then we have what we call the clear fear value, which is a reduction from the nominal. Uh, but then beyond that, we have to consider the whole wall value. And the whole wall value then takes into account additional losses that are usually in the form of uh, a line, like a linear loss, which would be uh, a slab edge where the slab ties into the wall. Maybe there's an impact um, where one type of wall transitions to another type of wall. There would be a vertical uh, linear transmission. The perimeter around the windows would be another linear transmission. The line of the roof to the wall transition at the parapet. Um, you can also have point transmissions where if you have a canopy um, and, and the structural member for that, even if it's thermally broken, the structural member that supports the canopy has to tie back to the main structure of the building. So uh, even if you have a thermal break in there to, to minimize those losses, there will still be an impact. And that would be a point loss because it's a, a, a I mean, it's obviously bigger than a point, but it's a single um, entity that occurs within a, a finite area rather than a, a linear situation. So we'll step, we'll talk about clear field for a little bit, and then we'll go and we'll talk about whole wall um, thermal performance. So when we start talking about clear field thermal performance, we're going to start on the inside, assuming that we have interior insulation. Uh, we need to we need to derate that for the studs. In most cases, in uh, traditional commercial construction, we're going to be looking at steel studs, uh, wood. So, but wood studs would have a significantly less impact. Um, we wouldn't use traditional wood studs necessarily, but uh, there could be a situation where you're using a mass timber structure, which uh, which could have a, a reduced impact on the thermal bridging. But when we look at, at steel studs here, we have this table from ASHRAE, and we can see that um, the reductions for studs occurring at 16 inches on center is anywhere from 50 to 69% reduction of the uh, nominal value of that insulation in the wall. And uh, the other thing here is that there's a uh, there's diminishing returns. So if you have an R11 insulation between those studs, you're losing 50% of its value from the studs. If you have an R25, you're losing 69% of its value. Uh, so the more every additional inch of insulation you add in that stud space is giving you less and less benefit than the one you added before. And then you end up in situations like this in some cases where you have multiple uh, structural members because those studs are, uh, you know, those windows are fastened to those studs. So you, you need enough studs to meet the structural requirements of those windows and their, their wind loading and all of that kind of stuff. 
So in this situation, you have very little insulation and, and you're going to get very, very little benefit from that. Uh, and the, the thermography image on the bottom right, where a huge chunk of that uh, building is yellow to red, and that the red says 6.6, .6, but it's actually covered up under the photo. It's, uh, sorry, it is 6.6, .6, so, but it's anywhere from minus 10 to 6.6 .6 degrees Celsius is kind of the majority of that facade. Um, but you can see that some areas are down in that minus 20 range. So if it's minus 20 outside and you've got areas of your enclosure on the outside that are, you know, 6.6 .6 degrees, you really have not, not a whole lot of uh, insulation in those spaces. So that's something to consider as well. The more structure, the more interruption you have to the insulation, um, you have to decide, does it even make sense to put insulation inside at this point? Should I modify my outside approach in order to get that value that I'm looking for? So then we talk about the outside and the exterior insulation and um, the clear, determining the clear field performance of that. There's numerous types of connections for exterior cladding. Uh, and the reason that I like to talk about this, let me go back for a minute. The reason that I like to talk about this type of wall, um, specifically the, this exterior with the cladding support clips and rails in this case, is that you can build this wall and it can support any kind of lightweight cladding. Um, the St. Lawrence Center for the Arts has has talked about the potential for um, video screens to be integrated in their in their exterior cladding. Um, you know, I don't know anything about <laughs> video screens that could be outside, and you know, I'm sure they exist. Not my area of expertise, but at the end of the day, uh, what what needs to be provided from an enclosure perspective is the the quote unquote guts of the wall that can support whatever the loading of those screens are. So you know, from a, a designer point of view of, of the enclosure, the architect, the enclosure consultant who's working for it with them, the cladding contractor, you know, we know how frequently the, uh, the screens need to be supported and how much the screens weigh. That's all that's needed in order to Pretty much, I mean, that's simplifying it, but but you can build this wall, you can design this wall, and then you can have somebody else who has the expertise in exterior screens come in and install these screens over top of this wall, and you haven't compromised any performance, and you've achieved that exterior appearance and that exterior function that the client is looking for. Uh, so that's why I this type of exterior wall construction is really my favorite and it's also very common to see uh, in, in commercial construction in our industry because it provides so much flexibility. Uh, so that said, there are numerous ways that we can support that cladding, you know, the, the clips and rails that I mentioned. Even if you say we're going to do clips and rails, well, but you can have aluminum clips and galvanized clips and stainless steel clips and fiberglass clips and they all impact the thermal performance differently. Um, continuous Z girts are, are basically rarely done in our industry, in our industry, in our geographic area anymore. Uh, the, the losses from those girts is so significant; um, it's very difficult to meet any kind of energy target. And, and in a building such as this, where we're um, really targeting higher performance, then we're really looking at intermittent clips to support those girts. And you're looking at, um, you know, the cost versus the constructability versus the losses, and um, and the different options that are available. And that's not something that's going to be decided super early in the process, um, but it's something that you talk about to uh, as a team to make a choice and and keeping in mind that there's benefits and drawbacks to the different materials and the different products. Uh, so that's a clear wall. That's the that's the the things we need to really be considering for the clear wall value. Well, now you have the clear wall value, and you have to derate it again. <laughs> um, and 
the the areas that I was talking about before, we've got these red lines that are representing the slab edges on this this building. This is just a, a building elevation that I happen to have on hand. And then we've got the green and the yellow outlines um, that are representing the perimeters of the windows. The reason that they're two different colors is because the green are um, patio doors uh, with Juliet balcony guards and the yellow are just standard windows. So there's uh, different considerations for this uh, building at the balcony guard, balcony doors with the Juliet guards versus at the windows. So that's why in this project I had them highlighted differently. And then we've got that blue line that represents the parapet. Now we're not going to get too much into the parapet today, um, but we're going to talk about about the other, the window perimeter conditions and the slab edge conditions. And again, you might be thinking, this all seems like a lot of work. Does it really matter? Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> So this is an example uh, of a building. This obviously, there's references to balconies and stuff. So this is not uh, not a performing arts center, but it's just helps visualize the breakdown. Um, when we look at the heat flow through the clear wall, which is R17, um, the heat flow through the clear wall of the opaque assemblies is 43% of the total heat flow through the opaque wall. 57% of the heat flow is through the transitions. So we obviously want to maximize the clear wall value of that wall. We want to, or I should say, we want to optimize it. Uh, but we also need to take a think about those transitions because more than half of the heat that's flowing through that wall is going through those transitions. Uh, so we talk about slab edges. This is a, a comparative photo that shows um, this in this case this is precast but it just shows the how a slightly different construction method can have an impact on the energy uh, so the assembly on the left uh, the precast is sitting on the slabs and as such there's no insulation at the slab edges there's no opportunity for insulation there's you can't get insulation there um, the assembly on the right, we've got the same precast, but now it's hung off the edge of the slab edges. We've left a gap between the precast and the slab. Uh, that gap has to be fire stopped to meet code um, when we're separating uh, different spaces and different uses. Um, in this case, these would be for residential buildings. So, of course, we need fire stopping between units. But the beautiful thing about that is that the fire stopping is uh, is usually a combination of sealant, special special sealant, and mineral wool insulation. So now, by doing this, we're getting uh, you know we're getting a couple inches of mineral insulation at those slab edges, and we're going from having absolutely nothing at the slab edges to having usually somewhere between R8 and R12, which is still not as good as the field of the wall, but it's a significant step up. Uh, and then, you know, again, does it really matter? <laughs> when we look at an R20 um, clear field value for the wall, and then we look at exposed, uninsulated slab edges, um, we're looking at a 60, so a 62% loss. So if we were to be able to keep our insulation across the slab edges the same as the wall, if we had R20 everywhere, versus if the slab edges had absolutely nothing, um, that's, you're looking at a 62% reduction in the thermal performance of your wall. And that's the two, um, the dark blue and mid blue that are pointed to by those red arrows there, a graphic representation of one versus the other. So, I mean, even if getting half the amount of insulation on the slab edge could bring you kind of halfway up there, reduce your losses to 30%, that's still a significant improvement. Um, and then the other thing, this is also related to slab edges, we have um, masonry and in the case of brick, you have a shelf angle to carry that brick at the slab edge, um, but the insulation is tight to that shelf angle top and bottom, so, you know, it can't be that bad. <laughs> but when we look at the right hand side of this, uh, these therm images in the bottom right of the slide, see that the effective reduction of a, a traditional um, 
shelf angle that's fastened to the slab. So it would be a galvanized steel shelf angle fastened to the slab. It's 43%. It's a significant drop. Whereas if you can stand that shelf angle off with either a proprietary system or just a basic knife plate or a basic you know, hollow metal section, and you can get your insulation continuous behind that shelf angle, um, even without additional thermal breaks or any doing anything really fancy, you're, you're bringing your losses down to about 15%. So again, you're improving the, the performance um, by almost, you're reducing the reductions by almost 30%. It's a, it's a significant jump up for a, a very basic detail change. So in the green box, are, it's, it's three different ways basically to achieve the same thing and, and the performances of them are very, very similar. So then when we, we want to we talk about window transitions. So the, uh, the windows, as I said, are a separate presentation, but the window transitions and the losses there, they get, uh, the opaque wall gets dinged for those. So um, I'm going to talk about, about why things to consider and why it's important. So you can see the, um, the three circles on the right show the head, the sill, and the jam detail. This is a window in an exterior insulated wall, clips and rails, very similar to the wall we've been talking about throughout the presentation. Um, but in this case, that window is um, not lined up with the insulation. It's sitting farther in. Uh, lots of times this is how uh, contractors may be desire to build it um, because the window is fully supported on the studs. It's easier to get it shimmed up. It's easier to fasten it a lot less finicky, um, but you're introducing these thermal bridges and these losses all the way around the window. You're, um, you're really aggravating the situation. So this is a, um, some therm models looking at windows in different positions. So if we start from the, let's start from the left. Uh, on the left of the screen, you have a window that is pushed out way too far. Um, and you have, in as a result, the insulation layers don't line up. You have, um, and you end up having a condensation risk at the inside face of that window. So in addition to losing thermal performance, you know, having to derate your wall performance because uh, the perimeter of the window hasn't been optimized. You're also now introducing a condensation risk, a moisture risk of uh, of the window perimeter there. And then when we go on the right, um, it's again a window that's set too far out, uh, just not quite as far out in this case. It's still it's still an issue. The one in the middle it's set a little bit further back and um, the angle that is carrying the window. So the window is sitting on an angle, right? Because it's not inboard, it can't sit, it's not sitting on the studs. It's too far out to sit on the studs. It's kind of over the insulation space. Uh, there's an angle that that window can sit on in this case. The angle it has a thermal break on it. So that helps improve the thermal performance as well. Um, and you can see in that case, there hasn't been any condensation risk identified. So it's, it's a coupling of thermal resistance and minimizing thermal losses that go along with um, managing condensation risk. And the, the more optimized your thermal performance of your wall can be, the lower the risk of condensation. Uh, there's also significant benefit to using a better performing window on the window transitions. So again, whether you've seen the window pr presentation or whether you, you're yet to see the window presentation, um, the, the top table there is if we're looking at a high performance triple glazed window um, versus the bottom left table, if we're looking at a typical aluminum window system with a double glazed window. Um, and it's, it's like a factor of five in terms of the transmittance value differences. So the you're going to get benefits from the window performance and you'll hear about that in that presentation um, 
but we also get benefits from those perimeter losses that help uh, help the opaque enclosure performance as well. So that's the end of my presentation. I uh, look forward to seeing you all in the question and answer session. And thank you for your time. <laughs>